so a uh, couple of stories. Uh, you guys uh, think that you are poor, right? Um, actually, I was, when I was in medical school, I was in Boston, and um, I had my backpack, and I was going to the Haymarket to buy my groceries because I was very poor. I couldn't actually afford to go to the grocery store very often. And um, I was passing by the metro, by the T, and one of the, uh, uh, you know, there was a homeless guy, and, you know, he's like, Hey, bro, can you help me? And I was like, I try to, you know, no matter what I have a belief, no matter what you have or you don't have, you should always help, right? The Prophet ﷺ was never asked something and he said no, right? So he was always, even if he didn't have something to help, he would find somebody to help, right? So our rule is to always help. So as I was fumbling around and whatnot, this homeless man, he's like, you're a student, aren't you? I said, yes. He's like, don't worry about it. Please keep going. I was like, oh my gosh, that was the day that the homeless man felt bad for me, actually. <laughs> you know, how poor I was. Uh, but uh, the truth of the matter is uh, poverty in Islam, uh, or in Arabic language, is actually a psychological definition, right? It's not a quantitative, but it's a qualitative. And faqir is somebody who has a need, right? And rich is somebody who doesn't have a need. So wallahi, uh, I used to feel very actually well to do in our refugee camp because we always had food on the table. And my mom would say, why don't you take this to our neighbor and I would just take one of our plates to our neighbor and we would feed her. So in my mind, of course, you know, we're talking about 70s, 80s, early 90s, just, you know, for those of you kind of like who were not even born at that time. Um, but we didn't have internet. We had no electricity. There wasn't much of TV and whatnot. So your world was just the cocoon that you are in. And that was my reality. And fast forward, you know, uh, to Howard County, uh, which is one of the most affluent counties in the United States. And up until like five, six years ago, I used to feel poorer in Howard County as an attending at Hopkins than I did as a refugee in the refugee camp. Why? Because everybody in Howard County had their, you know, big ugly McMansions and the cars and all kinds of things. So even though that you guys feel poor, uh, as somebody said, it's very likely that all of you will be millionaires. But the question is, what does that mean to you? And why did you go to medicine? And what's your aim of going to medicine? And are you there to chase the money or are you ch there to chase something else? Um, my very first day actually in medical school, Elio Raviola, he was this very old Italian dude who, um, who, was, any, who, who was, let's put it this way, anti-religious, equal opportunity discriminator. And, you know, it happened to be that I was with a Jewish guy, uh, a, a, you know, an Orthodox Jewish guy, a very devout Protestant, and a girl who was very devout um, Catholic actually and it was just an odd group we were four and we would have to share a human body for our dissection so he comes to us and he's like uh, hey you know isn't he missing a rib you know like kind of like the whole idea of the creation it tells you kind of like the mindset so God in academia in American academia does not exist except for criticism let's put it out that way let's speak it out clear and let's be and let's see that this is actually the lens that we are all living with and that's how we are actually these are the people that are educating us uh, so he said you guys are too smart to be in medicine and you are too stupid to be in medicine I was like wow that's the first insult in medical school I'm ready for more but he said if you are here for the money you're too stupid because by the time you're actually making money most of the people that you are with in high school or college they are probably VPs with their smarts somewhere else they can do industry, they can be entrepreneurs, they can do a lot of things. And therefore, if you are really here for the money, this is the hardest way to make money. And medicine probably is the hardest way to make money. So why are we attracted to medicine? What do we do with medicine? With that in mind, I want to start with just one thing. So I came back from Palestine, actually, um, and that probably will color a little bit of what I'm going to say. 
So I came back and this message, uh, my previous fellow, uh, this is actually, can you read the thing on the bottom? On, the, uh, on my right, on your left? Can you read that small thing? The number one rule for a great OR day? No? All right, so all of you guys need to see an eye doctor. Uh, that's not my problem, that's yours. Uh, it said, thank you for all of your teaching and gratitude. So she's a Muslim girl and she said, you know, I have always felt out of place. In all of my career, I was the odd person out. And this Muslim girl, then all of a sudden she has this Muslim physician as her attending. And uh, how, there was one person that I saw before who happened to come to my OR before. Uh, so the way I signal to actually the start of my surgeries is Bismillah. So why do I start every surgery with Bismillah? So she actually gave me this as a gift, uh, you know, she had already gone and I came back after she uh, finished her fellowship because the trip to Palestine uh, did not coincide with their uh, you know, last days. So I found this on my desk and this was so meaningful to me because that's how I start. Why do we start with Bismillah? Uh, I have to pimp one of you guys, so if you don't speak I'm going to start picking on you. That's right. I mean, like, you are starting, you are, Ya Allah, you are the healer, not me, right? And mashallah, I mean, you know, I've done about 10,000 surgeries by now, and patients come to you and they say, wow, you walk on water. I'm like, no, only if it's shallow, right? Because we are surgeons, right? We're not miracle workers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the healer, not me. By the time I start my day, so I have three rules for my surgical days, right? Well, actually every day, that I actually have to come up and usually I get up by Fajr and I rarely go back to sleep, but I make dua for myself and for my patients in my sujood in Fajr every day. Ya Allah, help me heal your creation. Ya Allah, help me serve you. Ya Allah, use me and don't displace me, don't replace me, right? So that level, just waking up with the right intention, with the right mindset, with that mindfulness to why am I doing what am I doing, right? And then the second thing is I actually call my mom and she always makes dua for me and for my patients. And honestly, if I don't reach my mom for that day, which you have to realize, she lives in Lebanon, you're lucky to get electricity and if you do, then the phone is not working and if the phone is not is working, then there's something else. So it's like a miracle to even just get into a phone conversation. Then I feel something is missing. Like, you know, I feel like something is not right. And I say, Ya Allah, protect me this day. I haven't been able to reach my mom, right? And the third is, I always start with Bismillah, to the extent that the people that work in the operating room, they say, start of surgery, right? That's, that's the point that they say, start of surgery. Now, I don't carry Islam on my sleeve and this and that, but I am a confident, outspoken Muslim. And people know that, and my patients know that. And many of them like it, some of them may not, they don't, you know, they probably continue to be my patient because they need my expertise, or they say, you know, I'm going to find myself somebody else. And I'm okay with that. But at the same time, you have to accept who I am. So, this is intentionally a white sheet. So we're going to do an exercise because all of you guys are sleepy now, all right? Here's the exercise. Have you guys ever heard of this white, uh, you know? No? Good. So you go, you're, but however, this requires real participation from all of you. Okay? Is that a deal? All right, so we're going to say the word white. 15 times. All of us are going to say it loud, right? White, white, okay, not yet. Get, hold your horses. And then I'm going to ask a question. And I want you to say the word, the first word that comes to your mind. All right? Is that a deal? All right, we're going to start. One, two, three. White, 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 white. White, 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 white. What do cows drink? <laughs> All right, I think my talk is done. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you guys were the smartest of the crowd. <laughs>
What, what happened to you guys? So actually, what do cows drink? Oh, come on. We are not, uh, yeah. here, comes, here comes the physics person. No, I'm just kidding. Why did you say milk? Some of you did say milk. What's that? You are psychologically primed. There's so much that you actually, in your own education, there are so many innuendos and subconscious things that we feed into you and you accept it at face value. Why? Because medicine is trust. People trust you and you trust your leaders, you trust your educators, you trust your teachers, your mentors, because if you don't trust them, you can't save somebody, right? So like our, and we speak with such confidence that you, it's almost hard to really argue that a doctor is wrong, even though, like you could be talking about economics or history, and then we speak with such confidence, you're like, my gosh, he's making me doubt myself, right? But with that comes so much implicit and complicit bias that we don't realize. And you go through this whole process of medical indoctrination because it comes from a purely materialistic, physical sense and basis that we graduate as physicians who happen to be Muslims, but not Muslim physicians. We don't look at it from a holistic perspective we look at it from a mechanistic perspective, right? I'm like, oh, it's a cataract. Oh, yeah, I should be able to help you. Oh, yeah, it's a cornea transplant. Oh, I should be able to help you. We are so good at diagnosing the disease and for the most part treating the disease, but really we're horrible at treating the patient. More importantly, we're actually horrible at treating ourselves, really, and acknowledging our shortcomings and acknowledging what does it take, who am I, and what do I do? What's my place in this? And what's the ultimate goal of all of this, right? So that's, that's sort of something that we really have to wrap our heads and minds around, that what am I here doing? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we do is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala huwa Allahu al-khaliqu al-bari'u al-musawwir, lahu al-asma'u al-husna. That it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. Now, teleologically, right, because any time that we don't explain, we can't explain something why it happens, we say, oh, teleologically, this is what happened. And you're like, what the heck is teleologically? Or, oh, well, I think there was something, you know, this is still, it's really hard to tell. Let's talk about, let's talk about this after class. Is that okay with you? Yes, and that after class never happens, right? Or it does happen, but, well, it's complex. Why don't you research it and come and talk about it and this and that? And then all of a sudden you got lost in the noise every time you want to bring something up. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. It's as simple as that. He is the maker. He's the giver of form. He has the most beautiful names. And my job is to reflect those names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. That's my job. My job is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. And my job, he is the healer that I reflect that healing property. But I am a reflection. I am not the creator. I am not the healer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sanurihum ayatina it's fascinating that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we shall show them our signs in the horizons and in themselves so that they what they recognize it is the haq so who's the haq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the haq everything else is falsehood no matter what it is any knowledge that brings you closer to Allah that's actually the, you know, there are a lot of people who are very educated and they are still very ignorant. You do not need to have a PhD to become ignorant. You can still be ignorant regardless of what degrees you have, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's telling us what we want to do. So I want you to reflect on three things that have happened, right? What is this, by the way? What is it? Does any of you guys have Android? MashaAllah, there are two holders back. Three. Okay, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Oh, wow, five. Okay, well, that's more than most. Okay. So, so is the camera good on this iPhone? Do you know how many megapixels it is? Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's about right. You're such a nerd. <laughs> 
sorry about that. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So, did, <laughs> so how about the nicest camera that you can actually purchase? Do you know how many megapixels the nicest camera that you have? Who has, well, somebody was taking these like really high qu frequency shutter cameras, he disappeared. Was he here? No? So what, what would be the, like a nice megapixel camera? What is an 8K camera actually? What, do you know? Like a camera that produces 8K images. How many megapixels would you think? Come on guys, I, I don't have enough time, so you have to say something. 500,000, mashallah, that's a good... You mean like megapixels or 500,000 pixels? So it's about 33 actually. Uh, and the nicest cameras that we have is about 50 megapixels. So that's what we have, right? So this is actually from Einstein, which is there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. The problem is we lose that miraculousness when we actually think about just materialistic, mechanistic, right? Because it's very important. What do we get judged on? Materialistic, mechanistic. We don't get judged on on the wonder of it. Why is it so amazing? Let me step back and reflect on it. So this is actually the wave light. I, I, I'll, I'll, uh, trust me, it'll make sense once I come to the next slice. Why did I show you the 12 megapixels? And then you, know, you realize how much your phone sucks. But unless you have an Android, but that's a different story. <laughs> so this is actually a wave light, right? So this is the wave light spectrum. How much of a wave light spectrum can a human being perceive? So out of how many? Like if you give them a percentage, so that for those who are not, you know, like what, how much percent of what all of the light that is in existence do we perceive as human beings? Very, very, very small. Seven percent? Five percent? A percent of a percent. A percent of a, so like one in 10,000? Okay. Is that about fair? All right. So basically, actually, all we see is from 400 to 700, right? And that is 10 to the 14. But actually, we have all the way, we go up to the 10 to the power of 24, right? So we actually, we see one of 10 billionth or less of all there is to see. So a little bit of humility is helpful in this crowd. In any crowd, actually, in America and the West, right? But that shows you how much the creation of Allah is so vast. وَمَا أُوتِيتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And little... So actually, right before COVID, March 9th, I was in Brazil. I was invited to give a talk at the Pan American, all of Latin America meeting. And they said, we want you to give us a talk because you are, you know, you are the surgeon who does all of these fancy lenses. Is there a lens that is as good as the human lens? Which means like if you have, if you wear glasses, I just take your lens out, put a new lens in, and then it's perfect. You never have to wear glasses again, right? And then I actually wrote, you know, there was a poem that I found, and the poem says, <clears throat> Many are the wonders of the world, but none are as great as man. Right? Woman doesn't count, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, I don't mean to be offensive, I'll, I'll, I'll come in, I apologize. But then, like, there's nothing that he hasn't conquered, the beasts of the land and the sea and all kinds of things and whatnot, and, uh, you know, he has found cure for every ailment save death. That's the end of it. And then I actually showed them, I said, what do you think of this? They said, yeah, that's about right. I said, yeah, that's about right. That was actually written by Sophocles in about 400 BC before Christ era. So about 2,500 years ago, these guys did not even have windows and they have conquered nature by that time, right? They have found the cures for everything. They didn't even know what antibiotics was. So really, the arrogance of man is still exactly the same from the beginning of time until now, and it will continue to be. That we think we are a lot smarter and more powerful and are capable way more than we truly are, right? So a tiny bit of a humility is really helpful. So this is a black and white image and a colored image. This is again, and there's beauty in each, but you see what the details that actually you do miss in black and white versus color. So just the beauty of color and the blessing of color in itself is an incredible miracle. So this is why I gave you your 12 megapixel camera that you are really happy showing off your 4Ks, you know, videos that you are taking with your iPhone. So the human eye, and I'm an ophthalmologist, the human eye, if you were to actually calculate it, 
it would have 576 megapixels. Not only that, but it's live, color, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get out of focus, right? You look at me, look at that person, it's an immediate focus, right? It doesn't let me zoom in, let me zoom out, let me, oh no, hold it, let's change the exposure, let's change this. And it's continuous video and it doesn't run out of memory. Have you ever thought about that, the one that you got for free? So at the end of my talk, I said, you guys are all arrogant. As a matter of fact, the best lens that you have ever had and the best lens, and I still tell my patients, I'm like, even if you offer me $100,000, I just cannot. Why? Because the best lens that is ever in existence is the one that you got for free. Everything else that we make is an imitation. That doesn't mean it's bad, it's actually good. We make, we, I mean, we make huge changes in people's lives when we do the cataract surgery. But there's nothing that we make, despite the billions of everything that we invest in, that comes close to anything that is made in your body. And as one of my favorite attendings said, the dumbest kidney is smarter than the smartest attending. <laughs> right? How many of you guys are in the wards now? Like, you know, you have acidosis and you have alkalosis. Okay, go and you know, calculate the equation. And now, oh, I have this equation that does it. And you know, how, this is how much we want to do. And this is, right? Do you think that, that the kidney sits there and says, okay, well, what do I need to do? And how do I do it? Or it just like says, yeah, this is it. And let's just, you know, do it so simple, right? So what you and fusicum in yourselves, you, ha you cannot stop marvel at what you do. You take this in every field in medicine and you will see that. So this is actually in my field, which is also again uh, an ayah of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْ And the beautiful thing in the Arabic language uh, is tafidu, it could have, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have used a lot of words. And when they hear what has been revealed to the messenger, you see their eyes overflowing with tears. Tafid. Why do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said tafid, like, you know, overflowing with tears? So, very quick lesson in anatomy. So actually, we make, we make tear film, we have three different components, this is 30 seconds, but we make a lot of tears actually in the conjunctiva, in certain cells and glands that we produce as well. But this is actually our lacrimal gland, which makes tears, but it also is a reservoir. All of us in ophthalmology, every time that you come to us, we actually will measure something called a tear leak. You did not know that you have a leak inside, you know, in the front of your eye, did you? All right, alhamdulillah, I taught you something new today. So this is actually a tear leak, and this tear leak, the tears come, they come across, you blink, it wets all of your eye, and then there are actually two drains that come to your nose. And these two drains, when you blink, it creates a negative pressure, and that suctions actually the extra tear that comes down, and therefore you don't even, you're not even aware of it. Right? What happens is when you're emotionally charged, something happens, or there's physical ailment, it sends a, you know, to your uh, fifth and seventh nerves, and they come back, and it floods the eye actually with a lot of tear, and what happens is it overflows. This lake actually goes too big for these two drains, and it overflows on your cheeks. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching you, that it is actually an overflowing mechanism of what really happens. So we need to actually really reflect on the amazing, and by the way, uh, do you know how many different components are in your tear film? Do you know what's the strongest part of your eye, like what enables you to see? It's actually your tears. It's not even your eye itself, practically. Just think about that for a second. So if you have expensive tiers, you can actually buy them you know, for 10 bucks and they'll last you for about a month and they have four different components. A typical tier film will have anywhere between 80 to 200 different components. You think of it as water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks otherwise. All right, so here's insulin. How many amino acids are insulin, guys? How many? 51. So 51 amino acids. If you were to actually just calculate very quickly the different combinations, you're making people feel kind of self-conscious that you knew it. 
Yeah, I, I, I feel your connection. No, 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 no. It's a, I had to look it up to double check myself. Don't worry, you guys. Um, and my mom even a diabetic, so I should know that. All right. So how many different combinations if you have 51 amino acids, if you have 51, how many amino acids are there in a human body? All right. So how many different combinations do you think to just make insulin is? Well, it's 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 to fill all of the 51 amino acids, right? So the possibility of combinations just by a chance to make insulin is 20 to the power of 51, which is 2.3 times 10 to the power of 66. So that's how many different combinations if you were to just have a monkey and, you know, like you t they tell you in statistics, right? Just to get this by chance. What's the fastest enzyme in the human body? This is not, you know, PCR, what is it? It's polymerase, polymerase, right? So the polymerase is 10 to the 9 per second. So if you actually were to take how many chain reactions does the polymerase enzyme do, it will be 10 to the 18 per year. That's the fastest enzyme. By the way, that works on base pairs for all of you nerds. We're talking about DNA and proteins. I know I'm mixing them, but for a reason. So you have 10 to the 18 per year. So if you have the fastest enzyme, which I'm giving to you for free, which is a lot more complex than insulin, and I gave you the best possible scenarios in order to just come up with insulin it, uh, correctly, it would take the, this enzyme 10 to the 48 years. That means 10 and 48 zeros in years, if you were to let this by chance. Just to happen about that. Just think about that. Reflect about that. So what's the age of the universe? For us? 7 billion. So about 13.8 billion, right? So how many years do we still have to get insulin on this, you know, in existence based on this? Just think, I mean, I'm just giving you examples that when you actually go to medicine, you look at it from an awe lens. You look at it from a marvelous lens. You look at it from a lens that is, Ya Allah, how blessed you are. Tabarakallahu ahsan al khaliqeen. Right? You are the most beautiful of the creators. Right? And you did things with such ihsan that I myself can't even comprehend it. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember what I told you about kitabun, uh, that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you signs in the universe and in yourselves. And that is what we call kitabun maqru' wa kitabun maftuh. So actually, I was um, celebrating with my wife our 20th anniversary. Uh, this was last year, and this was upstate in New York. And we passed by a park, and this tree just caught my eye. Do you know what's so special about this tree? Aside from it's like looking weird. Uh, yeah, you got it, you got it. What is it? What? Allah, no, it, uh, yeah, some people, Muslims have the most creative of minds. I send them these pictures and they write the word Muhammad in calligraphy to make it happen. And then they stretch it and they say, oh, it's the word Allah. And I, I think I can see it, I can see it. But, but that, right, you could, you could make it, right? All right, so actually, the, the, the way I thought about it is, this is me, this is me, this is me, right? What was the tree doing? It's praying, right? You just have to really just open your eyes and step back and say, what am I seeing here? What is the sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling me to see, right? Because once you open, once you have your heart open for Allah, Allah fills it, right? But Allah is also, He says, how many signs in the earth and in the skies, they pass by and they are oblivious and they don't know. وَهُمْ عَنْهَا مُعْرِضُونَ Sometimes they are, like, they are completely turned away. Why? Because our system does not teach you to be in awe of Allah. It teaches you to be in awe of the pill that you're going to give your patient. It teaches you to be in awe of the surgical skill of your mentor who basically walks on water and you have to worship those people, right? Astaghfirullah. But it doesn't teach you to respect you as a person, as a human, as somebody who has a mission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here we go. So this is where you're going to become a millionaire. 
Before you become a millionaire, please remember that the lust for comfort, we talked about this at lunch, murders the passion of the soul. So don't ever kill your soul for some worldly thing. You are too expensive. You are too precious. Don't sell yourself too short. Follow your dreams. Follow your destiny that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and has put you on earth for. So don't just say, oh, I want to do this. Wallahi, money will follow you. I mean, like, honestly, I am not, like, trust me, uh, I'm even making money while I'm here right now, right? So it's uh, money will follow you. You will make more money than what you need and potentially what you want. But sometimes somebody says somebody is so poor, the only thing they have is money. Right? So don't be that person. Have a purpose, have a meaning, have a calling. Why? Because, wallahi, if you find your calling, it will show in you and on you. That you go, you get up and you say, Ya Allah, I am so amazed, alhamdulillah, that you are allowing me to do this. I think, um, what, how much time do I have? A little bit, right? So all of us are born without bringing anything into this world. Did any uh, one of you get, bring something? An extra tooth? Were you born with some teeth? Maybe? Kind of? All right. And we die without taking anything with us. Is that right? Mm, mm, kind of? Maybe? And the sad thing is that in the interval between life and death, we fight for what we did not bring and what we cannot take. But you can take one thing with you. Something has to meet you on the other side. So إِذَا مَاتَ ابْنُ آدَمْ If the son of Adam dies, the daughter of Adam dies, قَالَ النَّاسِ مَاذَا تَرَكَ وَرَاءَ What have they left behind? Right? What did they leave? How much? Oh my gosh, how is this? وَقَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ But the angels say, مَاذَا قَدَّمَ أَمَامَ What have they sent forward? So what do you send forward? So with every surgery that I do, I say, Bismillah, Ya Allah, this is for you. This is sadaqa, Ya Allah. Every time this person wakes up in the morning, they blink, they see, that's a sadaqa for uh, yeah, That's a sadaqa, Ya Allah, right? No matter what, وَفِي كُلِّ كَبِدٍ رَطِبٍ sadaqa. He didn't say to the Muslims, he didn't say to the believers or to the ones who have beards or the ones who have a hijab or the ones who have just come and pray in the masjid. He said in every living, breathing soul is an opportunity for you to do khair. And if you did not catch Abdul Rahman, he didn't call it Medicare. What did he call it? Medikhair. Right? Did you guys catch that or no? Right, yeah, yeah. Because we are here to do khair, right? And you have to care before you take care of people. You literally, genuinely have to care for them. This is actually even before the Prophet ﷺ, where educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. The only thing that it breeds is arrogance, actually. And a Western mindset is, how can I conquer this problem, right? A holistic mindset is, how can I solve this problem? And there's a big difference between how can I conquer this disease versus what can I do to manage this disease. And this disease, this I, belongs to a patient, who belongs to a family, who belongs to a community, who belongs to a society. And that's how you have to think about it. That what I am doing is I am this little in the canvas of this universe. But just like Rumi said, by the way, all of you guys say, oh, I'm a medical student and I'm too, you know, too small and too little and too dead and too in the bottom of the totem pole to make a difference, right? How many of you guys think that you're too small to make a difference? Come on, raise your hands, be honest. All right. 60% so, uh, are honest and 40% are still working on it. Um, <laughs> no, but all of us at some point in some level, we think that we are too small to make a difference, right? But one of the great things is that if you really think that you are too small to make a difference, Try to sleep with a mosquito. So I want you to be that mosquito. Did you guys get it? Alhamdulillah. All right. So I want you to be that mosquito. I want you to be that person who makes the noise, who makes people uncomfortable in the right way. I don't want you to be a mosquito sucking people's blood. Please don't. But I want you to be that mosquito to make a difference, to bring attention to things, to cause a sleepless nights for people who should not be really asleep. 
Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu, he taught us that he said, Kunu du'atan lillahi wa antum samitun. That be callers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without speaking a word. Right? So how can you call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without speaking a word? So they said, how can we do it? He said, bi akhlaqikum wa a'malikum. With your akhlaq, with your a'mal. That people see you and they say, MashaAllah, this person is special. MashaAllah, she is just something else. MashaAllah, like when she walks into the room, you feel something is different. They bring that peace. They bring that tranquility. They bring that humanity. They bring that humility. They bring that care, that comfort, right? That's what they bring with them. They don't bring the, you know, like the patient is this and the patient is that. Have you, by the way, have any of you guys been, I know like I'm jumping back and forth, but have any of you, well, this is HIPAA, you don't have to say it. But if you've ever been sick, right? Or you have a family person who's sick, you realize how alienating our medical system is. You go there and all of a sudden you are nobody. We take, you, you know, we take your clothes off, give you this gown that God knows, if you're a Muslim, please ask for two, don't, don't, uh, don't request just one, because otherwise half of you will be uncovered, whether you're male or female. This happened to me before many times. I'm like, no, no, give me two. They're like, no, no, why two? I'm like, I just need two and probably three, so can I have two, please? Um, and actually in Maine, when you know, we had the Somali refugees, the women would never come back to the hospital. They come for the first and then they never come back. And they said, why are they not coming back? They say, I go to the hospital and, you know, they make me naked and then, like, you, they expect me to come back. Like, all of my haya, all of my modesty, all of this. So, again, we have stripped you of your humanity to treat your disease. And instead of giving you your humanity back by, you know, by helping you through your disease. So, who are you? Aside from your name, who are you? Has anybody really defined themselves? Who am I? Like, what am I? Right? What do you want? When you went to, by the way, how many of you guys gone to medicine because your parents want you to go to medicine? Come on. Okay, so 40% of you were working on your honesty. Now it's really actually like 94% of you guys need to work on your honesty. So how many of you guys thought like, okay, you know, like I wanted to be a doctor and that's what I wanted to be. Versus like, okay, so, okay, so mashallah, you still have to work on your honesty. Jazakumullah, yeah, that's perfect. Um, which is great. I mean, that's fantastic. But how many of us have gone to medicine for things outside of us, right? Factors outside of us. But now that we are here and you're in medicine, well, what do you want out of it? You're working hard. You are, you know, you are missing out on everything that all of your college roommates and friends have done. But what do you want out of medicine? Have you given it a thought? Is it worth the investment that you're going into? Is it worth everything that you are sacrificing for, right? I think most of us, we just wake up and we get into this routine of doing things and just going by and getting by. And I just have to, and by the way, uh, I have a, something for you. Actually, the easiest thing for you guys, to be honest, for all of us, me included, is school. It's really easy. You go, you study a book, you get an exam, you do really well, you feel great about yourself, you validated, and you're like, okay, yes, the journey keeps on, right? That's actually really easy. Like exams are, you know, if you were not good at exam taking and studying, you wouldn't be here, right? That's, that's just the way it is. That's the easy part. The difficult part is actually recognizing, well, what do I do after that? Okay, I finished. How do I use it? Who have I become in the process? Where am I heading? How am I going to utilize it? Who should I benefit? Right? So I, what I tell folks is, how many of you guys know a little bit about Islamic history in medicine? Like I expect the architects to know Islamic history in architecture, right? In engineering. But in medicine, how many people have some sort of interest in Islamic history? Like in medicine? A few. All right. So do you know that, so who invented the suturing techniques? That's right. So we actually, till today, so many of the instruments that we use in the surgical suite is actually from the Muslims. The chromic gut suture that we actually still use 
That's from the Muslims. We invented that. So you belong to that civilization and you are a continuation of that civilization. When was the last time in American news or media or, by the way, I am a very loyal patriotic American. Please don't, you know, um, uh, don't, I don't want things to go out of this room, you know, misrepresented. <laughs> when was the last time something good came out of China? Well, all of your clothes, aside from that, nothing. But when was the last thing really in the media? Did we say, by, and I'm, I'm making a point here. When was the last time anything good came out of Russia? Even though they were the first to, you know, to go around the moon and whatnot, right? But we don't hear about it. When was the last time something really, really great that contributed to humanity came out of China? We don't hear about it. How about Japan? We don't hear about it. Why? Have you ever thought about it? Why nothing good comes out except in Western civilizations? We are very ethnocentric. Anything good, so you know, history starts here and stops here. We cherry pick what happens. We cherry pick what we teach you. We cherry pick, and God forbid, if you ask us any of us, what do you think about Chinese herbal medicine? Are you like? Are you a medical student? By the way, do, you, do they teach you this these days or are they still absolutely nothing, right? Why do you think that is the case? I'll leave you to answer that question. The one lesson that I want to share with you, actually two lessons, and then I'll be pretty much done uh, uh, with this. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he says, he teaches us actually in the Quran what to say. And he says, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ This is something that you guys repeat in the salawat if, you know, uh, at the very beginning of the salah, uh, depending on what madhab and what teachings you have. That my salah, my acts of servitude, belong to Allah. But Allah doesn't stop at that. And he said, and all of my life and even my death belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means that I don't just leave things at the masjid, but I actually carry Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with everything that I do. And Allah is the center stage of everything that I do. And Ibn Ata, he said something that is beautiful. He said, Ilahi ma faqada man wajadak wa ma wajada man faqadak. Ilahi, the one who has you, they don't need anything else. And the one who doesn't have you, nothing else is enough for them. So you have to find Allah in your profession. You have to find Allah in your calling. The second thing is, وَقُلْ اِعْمَلُوا People have very lofty ideas of what we want. We, uh, one of the speakers talked about himma and azim, so I'm not going to repeat it. That you have to do the work. And all of you guys are really good at doing the work. But work without iman can lead to misguidance, وَلْيَاذُ billah. That you have, and we are so good and we are so strong in the physical scientists, sciences from a Western sense, but we actually don't even understand the basics of our aqidah and our theology, and that is why we find it very uncomfortable navigating the two. So all of the time, even our mindset, oh, let me rely on this, let me rely on that. But that's not because your aqidah is weak. That's not because the Islamic sciences are actually quite the contrary. I mean, they are incredibly sophisticated. But what has happened to each one of us is that we are much stronger in the physical sciences than in the spiritual sciences and therefore our comfort zone is here. And we don't want to venture into something that we are not comfortable with. There were two people who taught me uh, tremendous, actually, uh, uh, lessons. Which is when I was at the Aqsa, there was this woman, and for those of you who have been or if you haven't, uh, the Aqsa actually, the neighbors of the Aqsa share walls with the Aqsa. Meaning like the Aqsa, mashallah, has, you know, big, big walls. And there are people who are living on the other side. So we were passing by the, you know, and this woman has the most beautiful of smiles. And I'm like, Assalamu alaikum khalti, kif akhbarik? Assalamu alaikum ya khala, auntie, how are you? And she's like, alhamdulillah, you know, and she had like most beautiful, serene, just happy as, you know, as anything can be. And I said, where, where do you live? She looks at me with the most beautiful, proud smile, and she's like, right there. Now, if you don't understand this lady, uh, sometimes if the Israelis close the door to the masjid, she can't make it to her house. So sometimes she's, in tra she's trapped in, she can't leave. 
and sometimes she's trapped out, she can't go in, right? So that, that's unfortunately the situation for her. So you, and the house that she lives in is actually smaller than this stage, basically. This woman had no teeth. And then I didn't give it a, uh, another thought, and I just walked. And then one of our guides in the Aqsa, he said, you know, she has been offered $10 million for that space by the Israelis. And she said, no. Just want you to pause. What can you do with $10 million? A lot of things. A lot of things. You guys are laughing. You're like, give me the $10 million. I'll go get a villa in Mecca, get few, you know, domestic helpers, uh, get the nicest of cars, and fix my teeth. And, uh, you know, Mecca is a lot holier than Al-Aqsa, right? I mean, from a spiritual perspective, from a purely materialistic, mechanistic, Western perspective, why the heck do I have to deal with these no names, people that basically occupy me and do all kinds of things and whatnot to my people. Why do I have to give myself a headache? I can just move to a different country and live a beautiful life, the most spiritual of life. I could be in the haram every time and I don't even have to buy a house. I can just rent a room, right, right in the nicest five-star ugly hotels right next to the Kaaba and, you know, just to stay there and just live a beautiful life of peace, right? Why did she say no? Because that was her masjid. That was her life. She had a higher purpose. She did not need the money. She needed to be there. How many of us compromise our life for a lot less price? And that we are in much better situation than she is. But this woman, she knew who she was. She defined herself. She knew her priorities. She knew her mission. And she knew what she wanted out of life. And for that, she had everything that she wanted. And that's what made her smile so beautiful, that she did not want to fix it, even though she had plenty of opportunities to sell out. So what are you willing to compromise on? How many times if, you, if somebody or something or whatever it is ask you to compromise on your belief or on whatever you really hold sacred, what would your answer be? I'll call you a mo. Like, you know, they say, Dr. D. I was like, sorry? They say, Dr. D. I'm like, my name is not Dr. D. Well, well, it's hard to say Dawood. I'm like, really? They say, yes. I said, do you know how, how to say Tchaikovsky? <laughs> do you know? Do you know how to say Dostovsky? Yes. Heck, if you know how to say Tchaikovsky and Dostovsky, it's very easy for you to say Dawood. But that guy is Western dude, and this guy is not exactly your most Western dude, and that's why you're having a problem, right? Just like we say Europe never had a problem with refugees, Europe had problems with racism. They didn't have a problem, they didn't have space for Syrian refugees, but they had a lot of space for Ukrainian refugees, right? So this is the narrative that you have to own. You have to own the narrative. So that's the first lesson, is don't ever compromise. Because no matter what, you don't want to be looking back and say, what happened to me? And this is the last one. So uh, thank you for the signal. I'm going to be kicked out soon. So I met this guy. Why is it not playing? I have no idea. Uh, OK, I don't know why. So this, this little kid, Hussein, and he was in Amman. He was a 14-year-old. And he is the breadwinner for his family. I don't know what his father's situation is, but we didn't get into that. But his father is not in the picture. And he's 14, and he provides for his mother and, you know, his family. And he actually has a stand, right, like about this big in Amman. And he sells water bottles. He sells water bottles. Amman is a little bit hot. He goes to the supermarket, buys boxes of water, and he puts the water bottles. He, buy, he buys ice. He puts it on top. And he sells cold water, 20, uh, 25 right? 25 cents. That's not really why he stopped me. That's just normal. But then right next to him, if the video was to show, he has this most amazing sign. 
And I said, you know, I don't see this very often. Why do you have this sign? He said, I wrote it. I said, why did you write it? He said, I wrote it. I thought about it. I thought it's a good idea. And I wrote it. I mean, he's 14 year old. Right? He's speaking with just the innocence of a 14 year old. The purity of a 14 year old. And I said, why did you write it? He said, I wrote it. And then, you know, I thought that Allah will be happy if I wrote it. So I wrote it. That's just, he had no other, uh, so I said, okay, so how many people take advantage of this offer? He says about, you know, 12 to 30, a lot, actually, he said a lot, uh, a lot. He said, how many? He's like 12 to 30. And I said, okay, and he sells about 100 bottles a day, right? So on the, uh, on the screen, he, it actually says 25 cents, and then, tafaddal, he says, please, do me the honor. And take one for free if you cannot afford it. Because it is of the money of Allah. Now, is he rich or is he poor? And I say, I, I read your lips, I'm pretty decent. Most of you said poor. He's actually richer than most of us. From a materialistic perspective, he's poor. I mean, he... But from a richness perspective, a richness of the heart, a richness of humanity, a richness of care and love to the fellow beings that are around him, wallahi, we can't match him. I mean, this guy is giving donation 12 to 13 percent every day of his revenue. And he's so happy with it. He's like, so then I said, and I'll finish with the last 20 seconds. I said, okay, I'll make you an offer. So he said, what's your offer? I said, I'm going to pay you for everyone who bought from you today. I'm just going to... How many of us will take that offer? That's, that's really nice. That means I buy more from a Western perspective and I can give, right? And as a 14-year-old, he's like, لا لا عمي, Allah يخليك. No, 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 I don't want your money. And I said, why? He said, أنا بعملها لله. هلا بتروح إذا أنت عطيتني المصاري. I do it for Allah. If I take your money, then it stops being for Allah. And I don't want that. I want everything that I do to be for Allah. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Once you understand that, wallahi life becomes simple. Work becomes simple. Everything becomes simple. So don't complicate it. Jazakumullah khair. إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله ما